Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. We're delighted to welcome you this evening. Uh, despite the current situation with COVID-19, it's good to see so many of our alumni, friends and supporters here. As with many public institutions, the university is closely monitoring the current situation and following Public Health England guidelines. Mark, our compare, uh, tells me that a previous Ig Nobel winner researched the potential of paper money to transmit viruses. So, should the coronavirus be capable of spreading through money, we ask you to place any banknotes that you may have in your pockets <laughs> in the bins provided and we'll collect, we'll collect them later for your safety. Uh, we're honoured to host the Ig Nobel team for a second time. This evening promises to intrigue and delight in equal measure. Uh, but first, some housekeeping. We aren't expecting a fire alarm this evening, so if you do hear an alarm, it's for real. Um, and if you make your way to the exits, and our team will show you to the safe meeting place. Uh, can I also ask you to turn off your mobile phones or to turn them to silence? Thank you. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce the university's president and vice chancellor, Professor Dame Nancy Rothwell. Thank you. So thank you very much indeed, Dale. We're delighted to welcome so many alumni, uh, donors, friends of the university to this evening's event, um, which is a bit different to our usual ones. It really is wonderful to see such a great turnout. And by the way, you'll find out what these are later. Uh, and you'll find out what these are later. There will have to be a little audience participation, I'm afraid, at various points. So you join us at an exciting time for the university as we're just publishing our new strategy and vision for the future. This has been based on extensive consultation across the region and, and uh, within uh, the university as well. And interestingly, um, a key component of that is our civic engagement, our engagement with our local communities, with the city. Of, and I was very pleased to meet today with our mayor, elected mayor, Andy Burnham, and talk about the commitment and the partnership between the university and Greater Manchester City Region. So as we are soon to be entering our third century, in 2024, the university will be 200 years old. And we're looking for the time up to that and indeed the time beyond it. And you, you can read more about that on our website um, because uh, we're inviting comments and contributions and participation in the university's future. So it's in this uh, spirit of pioneering research and doing things a little differently that we are very pleased to welcome back the Euro Tour of the Ig Nobel Awards. When we last hosted it in 2017, we were delighted with the fun uh, that ensued and the somewhat unconventional evening brought to us by the team from Improbable Research. This year, I'm sure, will be the same. As you can see from the title, Ig Nobel Awards are designed to make us laugh and then make us think. They are quite serious in some ways. They're intended to celebrate the unusual and honour the imaginative and spur people's interest in science, medicine, technology and all aspects of discovery. So this is an event that encourages audience participation. Feel free, please feel free to enter into the spirit of that. Uh, we're very pleased that one of our own staff, indeed a Nobel laureate, uh, Professor Sir Andre Gaim, is a past winner of this prestigious award. And as far as we know, Andre is still the only person who has won a, full, a normal Nobel and an Ig Nobel. And as he tells everybody, he is just as proud of both. And he's very comfortable. So you may know he won the Nobel Prize in Physics for the isolation of uh, graphene, and he won the Ig Nobel for levitating frogs. And if you ever want to look up how to levitate a frog, just Google levitating frogs and Andre Gaim. Unfortunately, neither Andre nor the frog could be with us uh, today. Um, but um, we are very pleased to welcome back to Manchester Mark Abrams, the co-founder and editor of the Annals of Improbable Research, the creator and master of ceremonies for the Ig Nobel Awards, and our, your compare for the evening. Uh, I first met Mark at the wonderfully successful Euroscience Open Forum uh, meeting, which we hosted here in Manchester in 2016. 
Uh, we'll also be joined tonight by three more winners of an Ig Nobel Prize. Two are colleagues from just uh, our near neighbours, Liverpool. So it's wonderful to see how many UK researchers are contributing to being recognised for such outstanding, groundbreaking research. As a scientist myself, uh, I often tell young people, don't think science is boring and dull. It's also great fun, it should be amusing, and you should get a lot more out of it than just discovering normal things. You never know what is just around the corner. So I'm going to hand over to Mark and say, do enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you all for joining us. We, uh, we have lots of things to show and, uh, and tell you. Um, this hat is too small. It's going to fall off from time to time. I apologize for that, but not very much. <laughs> this is all about things that make people laugh and then think. It's also about surprise. Uh, I want to mention one thing about science that maybe you've all thought about a lot, but maybe not, that for almost all of us, most of the stuff we learn in school at every level about science, all the famous discoveries, all the famous discoverers, the story that we get always boils down to so-and-so who was a genius discovered this and everybody knew that this was very important at that moment. That almost never happens. If you really track down the story for anything that you know, any famous discovery, or if you're lucky enough to meet somebody who discovered something and eventually became famous for it. If you really track down what it was like the first few days, it was almost never like that. It was almost always filled with lots of colleagues who said, that's not gonna work, that's stupid, don't do that, um, and much worse. But occasionally, somebody discovers something and other people realize this is useful and important, and eventually some of those turn into valuable, money kind of valuable things. From that point on, the story changes. From that point on, the original story vanishes. From that point on, the story is so-and-so, who was a genius, discovered this and everybody knew it. So I just wanted to mention that before we start. I'm going to talk for a while, I'm going to show you a bunch of things that won Ig Nobel Prizes. And because of the situation here, here being around the world, everywhere, going to start with um, a few things that pertain to the coronavirus. Uh, but, because I'm always sticking in things before I get to the point, maybe there will be one or two things before that, like this. This is a very brief ritual. I wanted to give you a feel for what happens in our office at Improbable Research on a typical morning. This next little video is an experiment that was done at uh, the University of Chile. <laughs> they, I do not include the chicken in the they, the scientists were trying to see if they could figure out when dinosaurs walked, how did they walk? What kind of motion did they have? What kind of stride? What kind of gait? And they realized that chickens have a lot of resemblances and are strongly related to dinosaurs, but there are no living dinosaurs that they can watch. And they realized if we just add some extra bones in a particular place at the back, that structure becomes really similar to the fossils we've seen on a lot of dinosaurs. So let's do that with a chicken. That's what they did. They won an Ig Nobel Prize for that. And the uh, team came to the Ig Nobel ceremony. Oh, you want like a diamond? <laughs> so now the team is more versatile and the women have it as they hate. Thank you. I hope you agree that uh, deserves some kind of prize. <laughs> and this is what it's all about. You've already heard this phrase a couple times tonight. The prizes are unusual prizes. The prizes, the Ig Nobel prizes, don't 
mean you've done something wonderful, nor do they mean you've done something the opposite of wonderful. Good and bad, that is not relevant to these prizes. Important or not, that is not relevant. Uh, valuable or worthless, that's not relevant. The only thing that matters if you get an Ig Nobel Prize is that says you've done something that makes people laugh and then think. You've done something that when almost anybody anywhere in the world hears about it, their immediate reaction is probably going to be to laugh for whatever reason. But also there's something about what you've done that's going to stick in their minds so that a week later they're probably still thinking about it and they want to talk about it with their friends. That's the double quality that wins an Ig Nobel Prize. We have a magazine, the Annals of Improbable Research, and we collect research of all kinds, new, old, from everywhere, on all sorts of stuff. And you can see just by looking at some of the magazine covers, we span everything. There are people who are doing research on things you would not dream of. Some of these things you may think are completely crazy and you might be right, and some of them that are genuinely completely crazy may be the most important things that anybody will ever discover. You just never know. We um, devote one issue of the magazine every year to the Ig Nobel Prize winners from that year, and just by looking at the span of a few covers, you can get a little glimpse at the wide range of things that people have been interested in trying to figure out. Well. Tonight, because the coronavirus is spreading around the world and we're all getting lots of advice and everything is very, very new, including the advice, we thought, let's try a little experiment. One thing that I'm sure you've all heard is we're being told it gets transmitted partly by people who touch something that has the virus and then they touch their face, especially their mouth or their eyes or their nose. So we're being told, don't touch your face. Well, that's difficult because we're also being told everybody does touch their face a lot. Well, how do we know this? We'll find out. I'm going to ask you if you will be so kind. Whenever you see one of, our, one of the people up here speaking, beginning with me, if you see one of us touching our face, would you please let us know? And the simple way to do that is just say out loud the word face. Can we try that? Face. Good. One more time. Face. Okay. So tonight, whenever you see anybody doing it, just say the word. Face. Okay. We have here one of the lesser known longtime employees of the university whose job for many years has been to tally how many times people touch their face. <laughs> and he has kindly agreed to sit here during the duration of this event and tally for each of us. And at the end of the night, we should be able to look at that tally and compare how each of us touches our face more often, less often than the others. Thank you. And thank you. Um, before I get to the Ig Nobel Prizes, a quick look at some public health research that pertains to how we're supposed to deal with the coronavirus situation. Uh, a lot of this appeared a few years ago in a special issue of the magazine devoted to sneezing, coughing, and nose blowing. There's a lot of published research about hand washing. Uh, you're seeing a picture of Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis, who lived a couple of hundred years ago. I didn't even realize I was doing it. Thank you. Dr. Semmelweis was one of the first doctors who really pushed to other doctors the idea that you should wash your hands before you touch a patient, especially if you're helping somebody give birth or you're, you're cutting them open to do some sort of operation, you should wash your hands. This did not go well for Dr. Semmelweis. The other doctors quite literally ruined his career. But that was a long time ago. Other doctors have pushed this idea things have changed. Now, it's not at all unusual to occasionally find a doctor who does wash their hands. <laughs> There's lots of published research about handshaking. This is a paper called Quantifying School Officials' Exposure to Bacterial Pathogens at Graduation Ceremonies <laughs> Using Repeated Observational Measures. And 
uh, got a little quote here. You can see that uh, they saw 5,209 handshakes, and they measured the pathogens on the hands of the people who were shaking afterward. And their final thing here, they say, we conclude that a single handshake at a graduation offers only a small risk of bacterial pathogen acquisition. Still, it is a risk. There's been published research about touching one's face. This is a paper called Face Touching, a Frequent Habit that Has Implications for Hand Hygiene. They, uh, they watched some medical students to see how often they touch their face. And what they found was, the answer is a lot. Okay. Now, what's the worst thing that could possibly happen, do you imagine, if you do touch your face? You can imagine all sorts of things, but what's the worst thing? <laughs> Maybe. I dug up this paper I'm going to show you, which maybe is the worst thing. The paper is about something called rhinotelexomania. You may know that word. It's a sort of obscure word. It means compulsively picking your nose. So this, the title of this is rhinotelexomania, a rare cause of medial orbital wall erosion. That's technical jargon. The pictures that they include in this study probably tell the story pretty plainly. Don't touch your face, at least not that much, that way. There's been a lot of research about coughing, thank you. There's a paper called Why Do People Not Cough in Concerts? The Economics of Concert Etiquette. And they're trying to figure out if you have a room full of people, big room, small room, but it's got a lot of people, people do cough now and then. We, we seem to generally have the illusion that if you go to a concert, especially a really good concert, nobody, is, if it's classical music especially, nobody coughs. But what they discovered was that's not true. And it's almost certainly not true, even just if you look at the statistical fact of how things must play out. And they found that uh, even for a small concert hall, by small they said 200 or fewer people, that even a short piece of music is very unlikely to go through its length without somebody coughing. So you might pay attention to the sounds around you tonight, too. You're going to be busy. This is a paper, I'll just read the title, The <laughs> Anal Reflex Elicited by Cough and Sniff, Validation of a Neglected Clinical Sign. There's been quite a bit of published research about sneezing and nose blowing. This is a Japanese paper from about 30 or 40 years ago called How to Blow the Nose, an aerodynamic study of the nose blowing. The uh, illustrations are fairly clear, I think. This is a different paper called How Often Do Normal Persons Sneeze and Blow the Nose? You can see from the data in their chart there that at least what they found was that most people blow their nose, even at their healthiest, once or twice a day on average. There are lots of devices invented to cope with sneezing and coughing. This is one of many. This is a thing that's uh, officially titled in the patent a sneeze catching method and apparatus. Of course, you don't need the patented version. You could just use whatever you happen to be wearing. I would ask for theatrical purposes tonight, if anybody does do this, stand up and do it and take a bow. <laughs> you might want to leave hastily after you do it, but you'll have a moment in the sun. And there's been lots of research about wearing a mask, especially doctors in operating rooms who wear masks. What should they do if they have to cough? And there are at least a couple of published papers on this. This one's called, If Wearing a Mask, which way should you face for a sneeze? And what they explain here is you really should face the wound, the patient, whatever, because the mask is there right in front of you. And if you turn this way to avoid coughing or sneezing into the patient who's over there, it's going to leak out the side of the mask and go right at what you're trying to avoid. And some of you may be familiar with this patent. This won an Ig Nobel Prize. 
Dr. Elena Bodnar invented this. It's a brassiere, but a special brassiere that during an emergency can be quickly separated into a pair of protective face masks. <laughs> one to save your life, one to save the life of some lucky bystander. <laughs> Here's Dr. Bodnar at the Ig Nobel Prize ceremony with the first prototype of the bra, which she showed and demonstrated then. And here's the demonstration <laughs> on three Nobel Prize winners who were taking part in the ceremony who had never heard of this until one minute before this happened. <laughs> okay. You might look up the story. I'm not going to take the time. But she was, uh, Dr. Bodnar was raised in Ukraine. That's where she got her medical degree. And as a young doctor, she treated patients of the Chernobyl power plant meltdown. That's what got her thinking about this, which years later led to the invention. When I bring the bra, and I have one, this is, by the way, the only bra that I own personally, <laughs> I usually like to get some volunteer from the audience to put it on. But because of the virus situation, we're trying to avoid touching things. But this is how it works. It does separate into things. And as Dr. Bodnar likes to say when she demonstrates it, it will protect your life you know, for a brief few moments when you need it if there's some noxious or radioactive stuff in the air. Um, but most important, I'm quoting her, it's a beautiful piece of lingerie. <laughs> when she, after the Ig Nobel Prize, she got so much attention, she started a company. They now manufacture these bras. And you can buy them. It makes a lovely gift, I'm told. Uh, her website is ebra, E-D-B-R-A dot com. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Ig Nobel Prize ceremony and then very quickly about the most recent crop of Ig Nobel winners. Ceremony happens every September in the US at Harvard University. Um, it is always filled uh, to capacity there, 1,100 people. It's webcast. In fact, we kind of invented webcasting in 1995 for the ceremony. There's a lot of stuff that happens. You can watch videos of most of the old ceremonies up on our website, improbable.com. I'll just give you the real brief version. Um, anybody can send in a nomination. We get ballpark of 10,000 or so new nominations every year. Uh, a lot of people nominate themselves, but they almost never win those self-nominees. If you're chosen, with few exceptions, we offer you the prize very quietly if we've chosen you as a, a, a winner. And if you want to say no, that's fine. If you say no, that's the end of it. We never tell anybody. But Happily, almost everybody who's offered a prize says yes. And if you say yes, you get an invitation to come to the ceremony at your own expense, because we don't have any money to fly you there. <laughs> you get an Ig Nobel Prize. That's what you're looking at here. It's a different design every year. They're always handmade from extremely cheap materials. <laughs> you get a piece of paper that says you've won an Ig Nobel Prize. That piece of paper is signed by a bunch of Nobel Prize winners. There are always a bunch of Nobel Prize winners at the ceremony who physically hand the Ig Nobel Prizes to the winners. And although we don't have any money, we found a way to give a lot of cash to the winners. And each winning team now gets $10 trillion. They get a $10 trillion bill from Zimbabwe. The um, government official in Zimbabwe responsible for creating these bills himself was awarded an Ig Nobel Prize in mathematics. And to keep the ceremony moving quickly, we have a timing device that consists of a very charming, cute eight-year-old girl. Whenever she feels that somebody has talked long enough, she walks over to the person who's speaking, goes up to them, and says, please stop. I'm bored. Please stop. I'm bored. Please stop. I'm bored. Please stop. I'm bored. She doesn't stop until they do. And it works. And there's a tradition, which I think you know about, of uh, most of the audience bringing paper and using that to make paper airplanes, which fill the air during the evening. All right. So that's a quick look at the ceremony. Now a very quick look at the most recent crop of Ig Nobel Prize winners. The Ig Nobel Medicine Prize went to Dr. Silvano Gallus from Italy for collecting evidence that pizza might protect against illness and death if the pizza is made and eaten in Italy. 
He's published a whole series of papers. These are two of them. One is called Does Pizza Protect Against Cancer? Another is Pizza and Risk of Acute Myocardial Infarction. There are others. Um, go, go look up the details. I'm just giving you the real quick version here. The details often are much better than the, the little bits I'm giving you. Here's Dr. Gallus at the Ig Nobel ceremony being reminded to finish his speech. <laughs> and I want to show you just a little piece of an Italian TV news report. Grazie alla pizza vero e proprio salvavita per combattere un gran numero di malattie, l'Italia ha spopolato nella cerimonia dedicata agli Ig Nobel, i premi alle ricerche che fanno ridere ma anche riflettere, assegnati dal 1991 dalla rivista Annals of Improbable Research e dall'Università di Harvard. Okay. The winners tend to get an awful lot of uh, press attention around the world, sometimes that continues for years. The Medical Education Prize, it's a field we don't always give a, a prize in, went to Karen Pryor and Teresa McKeon of the USA for using a simple animal training technique called clicker training, which if you have a dog you may be familiar with. It's usually using a clicker, a little device that makes this kind of sound. They won the prize for using clicker training to train surgeons. <laughs> to perform orthopedic surgery. This is the paper they published together with a doctor who teaches orthopedic surgeons. And the paper is called, Is Teaching Simple Surgical Skills Using an Operant Learning Program More Effective Than Teaching by Demonstration? And what they say they've found in the paper and since is that, yeah, it works a lot better. Um, I want to personally recommend this wonderful series of books by Karen Pryor, who didn't quite invent clicker training, but is probably more responsible than anybody else for its use in training not only dogs, but dolphins, lots of animals, lots of people, gymnasts. Many gymnasts are, are trained this way. Um, she has a, a book called Don't Shoot the Dog, which I highly recommend. I won't describe it here, but it's a wonderful book. And here are the two winners at the moment that they emerged from secrecy on stage and were announced as winners. And here's the moment when a Nobel Prize winner was handing them their Ig Nobel Prize. Right. <laughs> this particular Nobel Prize winner is Rich Roberts, a British Nobel Prize winner. The Biology Prize went to a large international team, one of whom is with us today, Herbert. Do you mind standing and taking a bow? Herbert will be. <laughs> Herbert will explain. Later, he'll explain his, his team's research in, in much better detail than I'm giving you here. They were awarded a prize for discovering that dead, magnetized cockroaches behave differently than living <laughs> magnetized cockroaches. Here's their paper about that called In Vivo Biomagnetic Characterization of the American Cockroach. This is a little detail from the paper. And here's part of the team at the Ig Nobel ceremony. The Anatomy Prize went to two scientists in France for measuring scrotal temperature asymmetry. Anyone need any clarification of this <laughs> phrase? They won the prize for measuring scrotal temperature asymmetry in naked and clothed <laughs> postmen in France. Okay. And this is the paper they published called Thermal Asymmetry of the Human Scrotum. They were not able to travel to the ceremony. Um, oh, here's, here's some data, by the way, <laughs> from the paper. You can, of course, collect your own data if, if you have the proper equipment. And uh, we recruited an American postman to come and say a few words on their behalf. This happens to be the postman who delivers the mail on my street. He very kindly came. His first words, after holding this up, he glared at the audience and he said, you're probably wondering about my package. <laughs> the Ig Nobel Chemistry Prize was awarded to a team from Japan for estimating the total saliva volume produced per day by a typical five-year-old <laughs> child. 
This is their paper about it called Estimation of the Total Saliva Volume Produced <laughs> Per Day in Five-Year-Old Children. This is a photo of that research being done and of the, uh, the saliva being collected and the data about the saliva being collected being collected. And here at the Ig Nobel Prize is one of the authors who brought his three sons, all of whom had participated years earlier <laughs> in the research. And he had, he, he had them um, produce some more saliva, which he collected on stage at the ceremony. <laughs> they uh, say, in case you're wondering, that the amount a typical five-year-old child produces is about half a liter per day. If you have a five-year-old child, you might want to check that. The Engineering Prize, another field we don't always give a prize in, went to Professor Iman Farak Baksh from Iran for inventing a diaper changing machine for use on human infants. He's got a patent, which you can see here about it. He wanted to travel to the ceremony, but he was not able to come for various reasons. He is very intent on finding a company that wants to manufacture and market this. And he's asked us to help spread the word, which I am doing right now, and I hope you'll do. He prepared a little one minute promotional video to show how this device works. There's no sound to it, it's silent, but uh, here it is. If you have an infant, you might want to spend these moments thinking about how your child would react to this. <laughs> If you know of a company that you think might want to manufacture and market this, let me know, and I would be happy to put them in touch with the inventor. The Ig Nobel Economics Prize went to a team from Turkey, the Netherlands, and Germany for testing which country's paper money is best at transmitting dangerous bacteria. <laughs> this is the paper they published called Money and Transmission of Bacteria. Okay. Unfortunately, did not directly address the question of transmission of viruses. So that work has yet to be done, as far as I know. Here's some detail. They, they only tested the currency from a small number of countries. But here's part of what they found. Um, the euros, if you come in, contract, in contact with euros, which I understand nobody in this room does anymore, <laughs> um, apparently euros are, um, are pretty safe. They're not very good at transmitting bacteria, at least dangerous bacteria. But the Romanian Lu, if you want to transmit dangerous bacteria, that's the currency for you. And here are two of the winners at the ceremony. You can see they uh, prepared some special clothing to wear for the occasion. At least I've been assuming that that was specially prepared for the occasion. <laughs> the Ig Nobel Peace Prize went to a large team one of them is here, Francis McGlone. Would you mind standing up and taking a bow, Francis? And Francis will explain a bit later in much better detail than I'm about to explain what they did. They won the prize for trying to measure the pleasurability of scratching an itch. Francis, would you mind standing up and scratching an itch for us? <laughs> and here's their paper, The Pleasurability of Scratching an Itch, a Psychophysical and Topographical Assessment. Okay. The Psychology Prize went to Fritz Strack of Germany for discovering that holding a pen in one's mouth, like this, Technically. <laughs> they were awarded, we can debate this later. 
they were awarded the prize for discovering that holding a pen in one's mouth makes one smile, which makes one happier. <laughs> and for then discovering that it does not. <laughs> there were two papers involved here, published many years apart. This is the first paper published a long ago in 1988 called Inhibiting and Facilitating Conditions of the Human Smile, a non-obtrusive test of the facial feedback hypothesis. And then Fritz Strzok, the lead author, kept thinking about this. And he had a nagging suspicion that maybe what they discovered wasn't what they thought they discovered. Maybe it wasn't correct. And eventually, he went and he started doing some more experiments decided, yeah, it really wasn't correct. And he published this paper called From Data to Truth in Psychological Science, a Personal Perspective. Now, only Fritz Strzok was awarded the Ig Nobel Prize, not the other co-authors in that first paper. I am given to understand the other co-authors in that first paper still feel that what they discovered is correct. So we have a nice story playing out here that you'll see playing out time and again in science and everywhere else. Um, that's all I'm going to say about it right now, but Francis may have a few other thoughts. This is just a picture of somebody at the ceremony who was uh, trying it out on her own. And here is Fritz Strzok at the Ig Nobel ceremony. The physics prize, and this was the final prize we awarded this year, went to a large team. Nice. Thank you. For studying how and why wombats, you're familiar with wombats, the Australian animals, they were awarded the prize for studying how and why wombats make cube-shaped poo. <laughs> That's a wombat. <laughs> we asked the winners if they could take some of this cube-shaped poo and put it inside a plastic cube so it was a little more suitable for handling, which they did. That's what you're seeing here. Um, I had planned, because I have one here with me, to pass this around so you could all examine it. But again, as a precaution of the times, I'm not going to pass it around. Um, I'll hold it a little closer so you get no <laughs> truly better look, but you can have the illusion you're seeing it closely. And they, they still don't have a paper that's officially been published, but they did present this research first a couple of years ago at a meeting of the American Physical Society. And here is the team at the Ig Nobel ceremony about three seconds before the prize was physically handed to them. No, they do not normally dress like this, they told us. So that was, uh, that was the most recent crop of winners. Um, before we get to the three sets of winners who are here, we're going to tell you each briefly about their own research I want to mention a, a thing that won a prize back in the year 2000. Uh, some of you are familiar with this, I know, but it seems a timely thing, and I, I felt I really should mention it for everybody. It was a psychology prize. It went to this paper written by two people named Dunning and Kruger. What they discovered is now known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. The title of this paper is Unskilled and Unaware of It how difficulties in recognizing one's own incompetence lead to inflated self-assessments. Let me read that again. <laughs> Unskilled and unaware of it, how difficulties in recognizing one's own incompetence lead to inflated self-assessments. I sort of fell in love with that paper after we gave it the prize. And eventually, I wrote an opera about it. The, the Ig Nobel ceremony every year includes a small opera that I write. Well, I steal the music from dead composers, but I write the rest of it. And I wrote a whole opera about incompetence, which culminated in a song about this Dunning-Kruger effect. And I have here video I'm going to show you of that first performance of the song at the ceremony. It's an opera, so it had a little plot. The main character singing here is a psychologist 
who wanders into a bar, into a pub where he's a stranger, and he feels that he should, for whatever reason, explain to all these strangers in the pub all about the Dunning-Kruger effect. So that's what you're going to see. You're going to see him singing about the Dunning-Kruger effect, and you're going to see the other people in the bar, the customers and the employees, reacting to this strange person who has just come in here and is lecturing them. We have the lights down. The Dunning-Kruger effect, such a nice phrase, isn't it? Oh. The 30th first annual Ig Nobel Prize ceremony is coming up later this year in September. I hope you will join us over in the US for the ceremony, but if you can't travel and be there, I hope you'll watch live on the internet. And who knows, perhaps somebody in this room will be at the ceremony collecting a prize. This is the first day of this year's <laughs> Ig Nobel Euro Tour, which has now been split into the Euro and Brexitania Tour. <laughs> and for the next seven weeks, unless lots of events are canceled, which may happen, <laughs> I'm going to be traveling throughout um, that place that you people don't go to. <laughs> um, and some of the things have been canceled. We had a bunch of shows that were scheduled for Italy, and uh, those got canceled a few days ago, and yesterday the shows schedule for Austria got canceled. So I don't know exactly what I'm going to be doing over the next seven weeks or so, but we'll find out. If you have friends in any of those places, tell them to be on the lookout for this stuff. Um, the magazine comes out every two months. It's a very inexpensive magazine. It's uh, online, and it's in the form of PDFs. I hope you'll subscribe. It's full of research like this. There's tons of this stuff. And if you ever run across something we should be writing about, just send me a line, email me, please. I want to 
finish by showing just one quick thing that um, perhaps you might want to know about. This is a paper published about 30 or 40 years ago. And it's called Monitoring Electroejaculation in the Rhinoceros with Ultrasonography. Now, the title of this is significant, perhaps. But we feel that the title is probably not the most significant thing about this paper. The most significant thing about this paper may be the first sentence. Let me read you the first sentence of this report. This report begins, electroejaculation is difficult to perform on the rhinoceros. We recommend that the next time you write a report, no matter what the subject, <laughs> begin with that sentence. <laughs> so, those are my call them thoughts on various things. And now we are going to have the rare treat of meeting three Ig Nobel Prize winners who will tell you about their research. Or actually, one of them is joined by a colleague, and she will be telling you about a new paper on a very different subject that they came out with. Here's how it's going to work. Each of them, each individual or team in one case, will have 10 minutes to do their talk. We don't have the eight-year-old girl here, so we're using a different method to assist the speakers in, in knowing how the time is passing. We have two timers. Could the timers please come up here and, and take your place? Timers sitting in the audience. Thank you. Have a seat. And one of you has a watch or a clock. Yeah. OK. And you know how to use it to tell time. OK. And let me give you this timekeeping device. It has two parts. And you clank. No, no, no. This is for you. And just uh, hold them in whatever way will make the most noise when you okay. click them. Can everybody hear that? Yeah. Here's how it's going to work. They have 10 minutes. So we want to notify them several times. When the speaker starts speaking, keep track of the time, and then notify the noise maker. And let's do it at uh, five minutes, and then at seven minutes. So at five minutes, clank once. At seven minutes, clank twice. Well, let's try it once. So after five minutes, good. After another two minutes, okay. And after nine minutes, do it three times. And then after 10 minutes, clank and clank and do not stop clanking until the person <laughs> stops talking. OK, that's all clear? OK. Our first speaker is a pair of speakers. Um, Mina Lyons won an Ig Nobel Prize some years ago. And she may go a little bit into detail about that. but. Uh, I just learned that Mina and a colleague have published a new paper. It's just come out, so almost nobody has had a chance to become aware of it. You will be the first group to publicly hear about this paper. Um, they're here from the University of Liverpool today. Gail Brewer is Mina's colleague. Uh, you have 10 minutes to do your talk. I'll start your file. Uh, something else I want to mention is that we're going to ask each of the speakers to wash your hands before you begin speaking. If you could do that right now. We have the hand washing station over Please here. To wash any hands you think yeah, ought to be washed. Hand. Yeah. Okay, and I'll start your computer file up while you're doing that. Please do it properly. You're not taking this out of our minutes, are you? No. Nope. Okay. And the audience is going to kindly assist you by letting you know, each of you, if you touch your face. Hey. <laughs> Use the clicker. Thank you. And have at it. OK, so hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mirna Lyons, and this is my colleague, Gail Brule. 
Um, so some years ago, 2014, I think, uh, we won an Ig Nobel Prize for a study where we were looking at psychopathy in night owls, people who stay up habitually late. Um, but as a scientist, of course, we need to move on. So since then, we've done quite a few different studies. And today, we are going to talk about one of the um, studies that we did that was recently published looking at height in uh, football referees and how height might influence decision making. And we actually didn't think that this makes people laugh at all, <laughs> this study. So it was a complete surprise when we were asked to talk about this study. So it's the first time that we are presenting the results anywhere, first time ever. And we thought that where better to do that than two researchers from Liverpool coming to Manchester <laughs> a few days after the derby because nothing would go wrong then. No. Uh, so we'll go straight into it. Liverpool. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So our focus really here is male-male competition. And across the animal kingdom, you find that it's the taller, uh, the stronger males uh, that are generally seen as more dominant. They're more likely to win competitions, uh, and then they end up with a better territory, food, and more partners. It's not just our furry, scaly, feathered friends, though, that that applies to. And in humans, you find that taller men are more likely to uh, be promoted, uh, they earn more money, they get uh, more partners. Um, so generally, it's better to be taller if you can. Really? Now, <laughs> it's not, of course, that the shorter males are going to lie back and take this. Uh, you find, it's argued, that shorter men have a Napoleon complex or a short man syndrome. Um, and I kind of think of this as a mix of Dennis Wise and Scrappy Doo. Really? <laughs> uh, so, I think that this is complete nonsense, hang on, mate, because if short stature was not evolutionarily advantage, of, of evolutionary advantage, it wouldn't exist. So we have this fantastic variation in stature amongst human populations. And actually, being short can confer multiple different benefits to individuals. For example, if you are a little bit shorter, research has shown that it's much easier to move around in a tropical rainforest. <laughs> or if you are a bit shorter, um, you're much um, less likely to get cancer, for example, or you're more likely to survive a famine uh, because shorter statured people, their energetic requirements are much more reasonable than those of people who are of, to um, of uh, more height. And actually, smaller individuals play it clever. So it's quite stupid to engage in these direct aggressive contexts where individuals risk injury or even death if they are directly fighting with each other. So shorter and smaller individuals engage in more clever Machiavellian manipulation in order to get where they need to be. So these orangutans, for example, they have two different types of males. They have the large, big, fat males who fight with each other. They've also got the small males that go and copulate with the females up in the trees while the large males are fighting with each other. <laughs> So uh, there's different ways of competing, and um, it's not always that the taller stature is a good thing to have. And also, being tall can have disadvantages. Research has shown that tall people uh, die earlier than shorter people, and also tall men <laughs> are most likely to get bitten by midges. And who knows, maybe taller people are more susceptible to catch um, viruses in pandemics as well. But... <laughs> Ish. <laughs> okay, so there's only one way to solve this. We need to look at the data. So in this study, we decided to look at a sort of indirect male-male competition in the form of football. And I am going to say football, not British soccer or anything like that, because it is football. Do we have any refs in here, by the way? No? 
or nobody wants to admit to being a referee. I think there's one over there. Well, we may come back to you for a final verdict then. So, in terms of this study, we basically collected the heights of referees from the Premiership, the Championship, Leagues 1 and 2, and we took their height, and then we look at how many uh, fouls, how many yellow cards, red cards, and penalties they awarded. And it seems... Now, we didn't find anything when it came to fouls, but when it comes to yellow cards, you find that shorter refs are more likely to give the yellow cards. And in the lower leagues, you find that they are more likely to give red cards and penalties. Now, one explanation, of course, is that Scrappy-Doo over here uh, is more likely to be giving those ye uh, red cards, yellow cards, and penalties to kind of stamp their authority on the game. <laughs> I think that's an unreasonable explanation. I'm not really having that at all. Because also, the other alternative, uh, probably more plausible explanation is that the taller players are committing more fouls when the, um, the referee is a little bit short. So the referee is not a threat to the taller players. Or also, it could be that the shorter referees are just basically better. They are more vigilant and they are more able to detect when uh, there should be a, 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 a red card given to the players. But then when we looked at the higher leagues, the Premier League players, the picture is completely different. So what we found was that in the higher leagues, taller referees awarded more red cards and penalties. So it was the opposite to the lower leagues. Um, and, you know, it could be that taller referees are more punitive for... Or it's because you've got Dennis Wise on the team who's going around biting people's ankles and needs to be taught a lesson. <laughs> you never know. So, no, 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 because, <laughs> no, I'm just saying that taller referees, you know, they might have a, a tall man syndrome because they could be just exerting their authority in, in the Premier Leagues because there's more audience and they more get, get more kudos by doing this kind of behaviour. But now I've been sent off anyway. <laughs> and is it because I would... this is a taller researcher and I'm the shorter researcher? <laughs> so I would say there's only one way now to solve this and that is to go perhaps to the VAR and to the ref over there and say thank you to our colleagues uh, we have Thomas Pollitt, Nick Neve, and Dame McCarrick, who was the referee in the study. But it's over to the ref for their final verdict, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's for you guys to decide which one of us is right or what the data say. Uh, I was trying to be quite lenient. Um, six before, so. <laughs> there you go, you see? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think that's us. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have time for very few questions. If you have a question, raise your arm, and one of our referees will choose you. <laughs> Could you repeat the question so people are So the is there any disadvantage or advantage for females being smaller? So actually the evolutionary ideas are that females are smaller because it's actually overall better to be smaller because there's less energetic requirements and it's easier to hide from predators when you're smaller. So the male size, which is bigger, is thought to reflect sexual selection for male-male competition. Uh, so for females, it uh, it's actually seems to be, evolutionarily speaking, better to be shorter. Yeah, there is one sort of caveat there. Uh, we do agree sometimes. There is a caveat in that often we look at what you call sexual dimorphism in statue, uh, which is where you're looking at your height relative to your partner's height. Uh, so, for example, if Minna's female, I'm male, and we were a, a heterosexual couple, um, then this would be kind of on the verge, I guess, of how you want, she would want somebody slightly taller than her, but not too tall, i.e. a little bit taller when you're wearing your heels, kind of height. 
Uh, and that would impact on her pool of mates. So if she was really tall, she might find it difficult to find somebody who was that kind of, um, had that height advantage over her. Um, you've got more options if perhaps she's shorter, if you're going to go with that conventional male taller norm. Other questions? Are you planning to do a comparative study of stable to see if you come out with the same results? It would be could, could you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. Uh, we were asked if we were planning on doing a comparative study on rugby. Um, it would be interesting to do that. Um, we are actually doing something similar as we speak. Have you forgotten? We've got the study, study running. So we are looking at yes. people in different sports and their height and perceived masculinity and their performance in different types of sport. So yeah. we are looking at martial arts, boxing. Yeah, uh, boxing, so that's more the, the competitors tennis, rather than the referees. Uh, so it's not really uh, necessarily direct competition, but it's more how height influences performance in competitive sport. I think one of the reasons we looked at football initially rather than rugby um, was because it's perhaps more acceptable for football players to challenge the referee. Um, you've got all the classic photos of the teams just um, all heading towards the referee and complaining. There's lots of data on how much physical and verbal abuse um, they get, whereas you don't tend to get that kind of atmosphere in rugby so much. And we also had a researcher who's a referee, so that was one of the yes. main reasons. <laughs> what the really hell has been looking at football referees yes. because of Dane McCarrick, who is actually a referee and has got access to uh, all the referees from different leagues. Did you look at the height of the players that were being awarded the, the red cards or anything like that in relation to the uh, referee? We didn't, sorry, I don't know where I'm looking. Ah, hi. Disoriented. Um, we didn't, partly because we realised how tricky it would be to try and look at, really, if you're looking at the whole squad, um, and whether it's the height relative to the other players on the pitch, um, as well as the referee, then you've also got how much time um, the players actually spend on the pitch if they're being substituted. Um, and you know the different positions of those players. There are some positions that are more likely perhaps to be carded. Um, so we didn't for those reasons, um, but it would be interesting to try and factor that in. That's uh, all the time we have for questions right now. Thank you, Gail Brewer, Nina Thank Lyons. Thank you. Our next speaker just won a Nig Nobel Prize with his team. Uh, is joining us also from that exotic far-off place called Liverpool. Please welcome Francis McGlone. Um, if you could begin by washing your hands. I was taught this in a hospital the other day. <laughs> I've never done it before. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yes? <clears throat> okay. The Itch Ig Nobel. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all the co-authors on this paper, including the dermatologist that I've worked with for many years, uh, Gil Yosipovich. And I think I love the name. His name is Yosipovich, so his last three letters are itch. So it was Gil, basically, that when we first were awarded this, this prize two or three years ago, Gil, as a dermatologist, didn't think he could accept it, or, our, or none of us could accept it, because he thought it would compromise his position as a clinician. So it took some badgering from me to basically get him to realise that this is actually opening up understanding in something which is actually quite chronic and quite terrifying if anybody suffered from chronic itch. It's also fascinating. So it's an unpleasant sensation of the skin leading to the desire to scratch. And the fact that I'm talking about this now, many of you will start wanting to scratch various places on your body, and we have no idea where that social communication comes from, maybe infested primate colonies. Um, <clears throat> this is one area, actually, that we probably should have looked at. So in this study, we use an itch powder thing called cowage. So cowage was rubbed in the back. 
rubbed in the face, or rubbed on the ankle, and we'd expected to see, let me get my prop by the way, we'd expected to see the back would have been the most prominent area. Oh, shit. <laughs> Some model eye, maybe that thing. Now, that, that's called a homunculus. And that homunculus represents where your touch nerves are represented in your brain. So that's what your body looks like inside your brain for touch. And we were interested in looking at where the distribution of nerve fibers that respond to itch are. And there's some clinical importance in that in terms of understanding <laughs> where itch may be. Now, this is real. Yeah, this, 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 this animal, you cannot ignore scratching an itch. I mean, it is impossible to sort of to basically stand back and not think about it. And many of you now are having the same kind of uh, experiences, I think. But we were discussing earlier with one of the colleagues here is that scratching an itch is so rewarding. It, I mean, it is just pleasure going out of the window. And we still don't understand why that reward should be so rewarding in terms of what you're actually doing is just getting rid of a prurigen or something. <clears throat> so the neural basis of itch. <laughs> this is getting a bit genital, I suppose, into the, into the themes of the evening. So it was only really in the, around about 2000 that a colleague of mine, Martin Schmelz in Germany, actually discovered a specific nerve fiber in human skin that codes for itch. So there's a nerve fiber now that we know is responding to any prurigen, you know, flea bite, etc. So there's a nerve that responds to itch. And these are normally thought to be just pure pruroceptors. That was histamine was our classic sort of provoker of itch. And again, this is called a C fiber, and I'm passionately in love with C fibers. The, the classical C fiber is the nociceptor. This one has recently discovered the itch fiber is a pruroceptor, and I work on a third one, which, which is a, a nerve fiber that responds to gentle touch called a C tactile. This may drive why scratching an itch is so rewarding. Didn't touch my face. <clears throat> And this came up with some interesting insights into, into how we, we still know not that much about the skin, the nerves that innovate the skin. We're still discovering new ones, in fact. And there's just things that we need to know about the relationship between sensation and perception, because what goes on perceptually in the brain does not necessarily relate to what's going on at a, in, at a sensory level. So this got into some very deep sort of discussions about labeled lines, et cetera, and pattern theory. <laughs> <coughs> I bet you've got a dog doing that. So it is one of the sweet, so Montaigne, we've got philosophers on this one as now. Montaigne wrote this comment here, repentance follows to annoyingly close its heels, because scratching an itch, you can actually create pain. And in fact, why this, this is so serious is that chronic itch patients will scratch until a limb bleeds. You know, they'll scratch through that skin until the pain replaces the itch. That's how powerful this particular sort of sense It's obvious, I think, that four days is woefully inadequate in which to study the phenomenon of behavior patterns of this school. <laughs> that's, um, that's where you come in. So these school children are you five the staff room in the center itching weeks powder. I propose to consult with you all at length during the school halls to, uh, to draw on your experience and your opinions. After all, uh, you uh, you know the children. You're here all the time as practicing teachers. <coughs> to uh, start with, however, I'd be grateful for your preliminary thoughts here and now. Oh. The essence of hysteria is, in my view, that it's sustained. Oh. Continuous. Oh. That rattles on, actually, to get to see how that thing got more and more contagious. So clinic itch is distinguished as either acute or chronic, and chronic is something which basically you're scratching for weeks and weeks and weeks. And there are various ways that these things can come, come out through, through, through life in, in terms of people that have a chronic, chronic state that lasts forever, in fact. And it's very difficult to switch itch off. So although, as Mark says, th this idea of the ignoble opens up people's minds to something which is initially funny, but our expectation was it also communicated the fact how terrifying chronic itch is. It is debilitating. These two graphs here are just shown that in, in our lab in Liverpool, we can record from nerve fibers that actually respond to itch. And we can get at these things mechanistically. It gets more and more complicated as you see how these nerves feed into the central nervous system, up to the brain. And the areas of the brain that respond to itch are almost as extensive as those that respond to pain. 
And interestingly, people will, re will relieve itch by, by scratching in order to cause pain. And some of you may have seen a report a few years ago, some woman that was suffering from chronic itch scratched through her, I'm not touching, scratched through her forehead, through the bone, and basically almost exposed her brain. The chronicity of this itch was so powerful that she could not not switch it off. And in fact, um, one of, I'd, when we had the first itch symposium in Singapore with Gil Yosipovich nine, 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 ten years ago, and I invited as the, as, the, as the invited speaker an astronaut called Marsha Ivins. She's about four foot six, and she's been up on, I think, six shuttles. And I wanted her to talk about what it's like when you're out there on this boom with a multi-billion dollar job, and you see you've got an itch in your nose within your, within your spacesuit. And, uh, and she gave a tremendous talk on on just how you can resist itch when you're in a, when you're in a space suit or up, in, up in a shuttle. So that's me. Thank you very much. And again, we have time for a few questions. If you want to, while you're asking a question, if you want to scratch an itch, it <laughs> would be a perfectly appropriate thing to do. Raise your hand, please, if you have a question. Your choice. Anyone shout? It's got, <laughs> I can't really see too clearly, but yes. How do you sense pleasurability? How do you measure the pleasurability? Uh, we use so a, could you a, repeat the question? Uh, how do we rate pleasurability? Um, we actually measure two subjective states, one with intensity and one with pleasure, and basically a, vi a visual analog scale from 0 to 10. How intense is that itch and how pleasurable is it? So it was self-report. And when they were scratching the itch, that's where we got the highest rating of how rewarding that, that itch was there, rather than the back, which I'd say did surprise us somewhat. Um, the scrotal itching got me thinking. Um, <laughs> is, is there any asymmetry in people's tendency to itch? <laughs> I feel a research project coming on. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> how did you measure that? Um, scratching an itch was more pleasurable than sex. Well, they, we actually, we had a discussion earlier, because this, this, this particular igno will has lit up some, some arguments in various offices around here, where some people think that scratching an itch, scratching is more enjoyable than, than sex. I'll leave that open to the audience. If you want to try both at the same time, you may be able to <laughs> <laughs> augment the experience. But hey, it's powerfully rewarding. I mean, I'll tell you the best example. I had a patient who had his leg blown off on a landmine, and I was working in pain research in those days, and he not only had a phantom pain in, in this missing foot, but there was itch between the big toe and the toe next to it. And whenever I give that example, people really appreciate what it must be like to have an itch coming from a foot that isn't there. I mean, it's just a, root, it's a road to insanity. This little nerve fiber is fascinating. Yes. Okay, final question. I know, that's a great one. I think there's... <laughs> <laughs> but again, you know, I think there's a reciprocity. If you can't get to the back, you'll ask someone else to do it. And I think it's even more pleasurable. <laughs> Depends what it leads to, I suppose. <laughs> uh, Francis, could you maybe comment on... Um, a prize we gave a couple of years ago, also involving scratching and itching, was people who say they discovered if you look in a mirror and scratch the other side of your body while you're looking in the mirror, that satisfies the itch. Uh, that rest, that, that's interesting in terms of mirror recognition yeah. of, of why that should be. It depends on your, your, e it's your, your allo or egocentric mm -hmm. frame of reference, because when you look in the mirror, are you looking back at yourself that way? Because you get kids to sort of stand in the mirror and touch their left face and they get it the wrong way around. That was smacks of these mirror therapies for, for chronic pain. Is you get a mirror, you know, so you don't actually see the limb, but you think it's there. So it's like a rubber hand type of Great. thing. But. Well, that's, that's all the time we have at the moment. But I do want to ask the audience one question. You don't have to answer, of course. But at this moment, at this moment, how many people here are experiencing an itch? <laughs> You've got a photograph this, it's just, wow. It's a powerful social human communicator. Yeah. All of you who have an itch, 
when we're finished, if you would like to gather up here with Francis <laughs> for a group photo, that would be a nice piece of history. Francis McGlone. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker, when he did the work, was in Singapore. He has a large team based around the world. He's now living in Bulgaria and traveled a considerable distance to join us today. Please welcome Herbert Krepaz. And Herbert, of course, did the research on living and dead cockroaches. And I'm sure he washes his hands all the time. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. I brought some cockroaches <laughs> here. <laughs> okay. So I tell you about today something about cockroaches, about magnetized cockroaches, and uh, why dead and living magnetized cockroaches behave differently. For this, we got quite unexpectedly the IG Nobel Prize. It was a big honor. And in more scientific terms expressed, it is in vivo biomagnetic characterization of the American cockroach. And it's a story about quantum sensors and the American cockroach. And we had an international team. We are all physicists. Ling Yung Kong, myself, Agnieszka Goreska, Rainer Dunke, and Thomas Patrick on for biological consultations, Alexander Uvonek. How it come, came to this? One can imagine an experimentalist and a theorist talking together. Da. Some say animals uh, use quantum effects for navigational purposes and magnetic sensing, seriously, and then some scientific discussion starts. And the experimentalist then said, we built a very sensitive magnetometer. Now. Let's load it with some bio samples, but which one? Okay, now we all got, let's, uh, let's go to the food court. Are you hungry? So you walk to the food court. And in Singapore, when you walk to the food court, there's quite a high chance that you encounter some of these small critters. <laughs> um, some detour to human senses. Basically, there are five traditional human senses. There's vision, which reacts to electromagnetic waves between the blue and the, and the red. A hearing reacts to acoustic waves of a wavelength between two, cent two centimeters and 1.7 meters. And then there's the two related senses, the smell and the taste, which are chemical senses, one for gaseous substances, the other one for aqueous, sub aqueous substances. And at the end, there's, there's the touch sense. So there's the irritation of the, uh, the terminal end of the nerve, sensory nerve gives the sensation. And is it, so there's a question comes up, is it possible that we can sense something else? And there, the magnetic field of the earth uh, is a natural candidate. Uh, you can imagine the, the earth magnetic field as, is, is, as if there's a giant bar magnet inside the earth and it produces a field which is tilted with respect to the geometric north-south direction. And this field, uh, this field uh, varies over the surface of the Earth from north to south, so it is suitable for navigational purposes. When we look at the early history of the Earth, um, here you can see time arrow in billions of years, looking back to the beginning of the Earth. The Earth established itself 4.55 billion years ago. Soon after, a big chunk of the Earth got ripped out by a giant collision and the moon was formed, oceans formed, and later first life appeared about four billion years ago. And then a couple of hundred million years later, the magnetic field of the Earth got established in a weaker form as it is now. And thereafter, photosynthesis set in, producing the oxygen atmosphere, which is now vital for life. So, 
we see practically all evolution happened under the influence of magnetic field. And therefore, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, we don't want to, why uh, animals can sense magnetic fields. Magnetoreception is quite widespread in animals. We see from simple forms, bacteria, to insects, uh, lobsters, sharks, rays, salmons, trouts, to marine turtles, birds, migratory birds, but also domestic ones, to mammals, uh, bats, cattle, and even dogs. With the dogs, there's a, a funny story. Uh, they align themselves along the north-south direction when they do their business. And uh, this actually was awarded with a different IG Nobel Prize. <laughs> so how does this work? There are two mechanisms, two potential mechanisms. One is a chemical reaction-based mechanism. This is so-called radical pair reaction, where the chemical outcome of this reaction depends on the strength and the direction of the magnetic fields. And here is a, a structure of our cryptochrome which is a protein which is uh, thought to be the base of this chemical sensor. And the second one is magnetic particle based. So these are like tiny compasses, tiny magnetized particles inside the body out of magnetite or gray guide. And there's a picture of this. Uh, this picture is an electron microscope picture from, uh, from ants, wandering ants, Brazilian wandering ants. So how do these uh, magnetic materials come into the organism? There are two routes. One is biogenic. They are produced inside the organism, but they appear in very low volume concentration, and the size of this particle is really tiny. When we see a single domain particles, 10 to 100 nanometer, where a nanometer is one millionth part of a millimeter, and even smaller superpower, so-called superparamagnetic ones, 2 to 10 nanometers. Compared to it, now everybody speaks of viruses. A virus is the size of 20 to 400 nanometers. So then the, these particles are the size of small virus and even below. And they can come into the body externally taken up from outside due to pollution or to ingestions. And the picture here shows particles extracted from the, from the human brain, brain tissue due to air pollution. So are these materials responsible for the magnetic sense? And we thought, let's study a living insects. If we study living insects, we can tell something about the surroundings of these particles and maybe give some conclusion if they are suitable for the magnetic sense. So when you start doing experiments, you take stock what you know, uh, what is known. There are behavioral experiments which suggests lots of animals are sensitive to the magnetic field. Then there are the magnetization experiments, where they show that the properties of the magnetic materials are extracted from the animals. And there's evidence of magnetic material from several animals. And the third part is the models which connect these two. So there are mechanisms how these small particles would be connected to nerve tissue. And also models how this, the, the chemical radical pair mechanism would work. Here's a simple illustration. There are two magnetic particles which squeeze a pressure sensitive structure when the magnetic field is in the horizontal or separate when the magnetic field is in the vertical. And many other models has, have, have been proposed. Now, start. Let's do experiments. This is actually not how we did the experiment, <laughs> but it exaggerates our findings. And actually, dead cockroaches do not stick to the fridges. <laughs> so how we did experiments? We put the cockroach in a small plastic bag, 
and put it on a strong uh, magnet 20 minutes in a 3 kilogauss field. We didn't levitate, actually, the cockroaches. Um, then you move the cockroach away, and what happens? Inside the, the cockroach placed in the strong external field, the particles start to align with the external field. And after some alignment, uh, the, the cockroach field itself from the magnetic particle, you give a field which looks like a magnetic dipole. Then you put them in a complicated device, it's called a magnetometer, but it's actually it's just a center, here's important. There's a, a cell, which is the, the magnetic field sensor, and we pass a laser beam through it. And the laser beam, uh, the laser beam, the direction of the oscillation, the polarization is measured. When you bring something magnetic inside the shielded environment, you bring something magnetic to the cell, the polarization of the laser beam is rotated, and this is what we measure. So now we, we move the cockroach periodically back and forth. Okay. Sorry. Just to give a conclusion, <laughs> uh, the findings, okay. No, 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 go on. And you go on too. <laughs> okay. I saw. Basically, this is the conclusion. Dead magnetic cockroaches are longer, stay longer magnetized than the living magnetic cockroaches. <laughs> so. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have a question. Mm -hmm. so, can we get the microphone over here? Yeah, I'm thinking about the well, control hang, group. Hang, hang, Did you ever count cockroaches who are neither alive nor wait, dead? Wait, 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 wait. Just for clarity, since the microphone is there, you ask the question first, and then we'll bring the microphone over here. Oh, you've already got it. Well, right. First back there, because you started talking. Yeah, the, I just then, wondered about the control wait, sample, wait, the control group. Was it a cockroach who was neither alive nor dead? A Schrodinger's cockroach, if you like. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Again? Sorry, the question is? The control group. I wonder what the control group was. The sample he did nothing to. Did you have a control group to compare things to? Um, we had several, we, we did lots, about uh, 15 uh, different cockroaches. Uh, we sampled uh, various uh, live ones and then uh, the dead ones. And we made lots of uh, many individual measurements. So many, this, each data point there is the result of uh, many, many measurements. And um, to compare what changes uh, when, the, when the cockroach actually dies and what we found an explanation for this, actually. So we can explain with our model why this is happening. Okay. Now a question here. I just wanted to know, how did you manage not to touch your face? <laughs> how, how did we manage to? How did you manage not to touch your face? Not to touch my face, yeah. okay. Uh, maybe Is it handling I, cockroaches? Uh, <laughs> maybe because I was slightly nervous. I went, no, usually oh. I don't. <laughs> well, um, may, wait, wait, maybe, maybe this is the great medical discovery of, of the age. Maybe this is the key to making yourself not touch your face. Spend a long time with cockroaches. <laughs> Do you plan on comp uh, doing some more research on other dead and alive animals? Um, I personally not do now research on these uh, animals, but yes, uh, they are, uh, because lots of animals have magnetic sense, uh, there's uh, research uh, going on to, to, uh, to to find out how the sense actually works, which is largely still unknown after decades of research. 
And uh, cockroach is actually, they are disgusting, but on the other hand, they are small and fit easily into our device. <laughs> and they are not poisonous. You don't need to, f to, to, f to ask for permission from the government if you do experiment with them. <laughs> They're actually happy that you got rid of a few of them, so. All right, and, and let's finish with a question for all of you. Uh, it's a two-part question. First is, how many people here find cockroaches to be delightful? <laughs> Fairly small number. How many people here find cockroaches to be, what was the word you used? Disgusting. Okay. And how many find cockroaches to be delightfully disgusting? <laughs> <laughs> Herbert Krapaz. <laughs> I'd like to ask for all the speakers to come up. Big Nobel winners, come up and take a bow. That's everything we brought to show you, including, you, this is cubic wombat poo. You may be the first in your social circle to have been in a room with cubic <laughs> wombat poo. I'll also mention I brought along a few historic uh, Ig Nobel bookmarks. If you'd like one, come up afterwards. So our winners. Please. And our timers. Stand up and take a bow. And our face touch. Our face touch powder. Okay. And thank you all to the university, uh, to the team that brought us here, to Nancy, and uh, thank you all for coming very much. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, very quickly, just to wrap things up, uh, to quote Ted Danson, the actor, um, humour is a broad church. It makes the difficult accessible. So I hope we've achieved that this evening. Thank you again to the speakers, to Mina, to Gail, Francis, Herbert. Thank you to our timekeepers. Oh. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you to our timekeepers, Hugo Face, uh, Hugo and Martin. Oh, thank you. Uh, the last public service announcement for me is to point you to the drinks uh, reception downstairs. So thank you very much for attending this evening.